This Hill Dickinson Commodities Webinar on Recent Legal Issues in Energy Trading. This is the first in a three-part series of webinars hosted by the Commodities team. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katja Tzidamidi and I am the Commodities team's paralegal. I am your webinar coordinator today and we've been introducing the speakers and fielding your questions. Um, just a couple of housekeeping roles before we begin. The webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be sent to you after this. The audience is on mute. If you would like to ask a question, please submit it using the Q&A icon. This should be at the top of your screen. Uh, it is a speech bubble with a question mark in it. The speakers will answer your questions at the end of the webinar, and the duration of the webinar will be 70 minutes. We have four speakers for you today. The first speaker is Senior Associate Miranda Hearn. Miranda has recently rejoined the team following an 18-month secondment to an independent energy trading company. Her presentation will be on contractual flexibility in LNG. The second speaker is Legal Director John McNeely. John advises on disputes and transactional matters in the energy sector and will be presenting on the question of whose terms apply to a sale contract. The third speaker is Paul Taylor. He is a core partner within the team's energy practice and he will discuss the impact of major price fluctuations on contract formation and performance. The fourth speaker is consultant Mark Aspinall. Mark has over 25 years experience dealing mainly with oil and metals from a trading and financing perspective. He has been involved in large-scale cross-border frauds arising out of the financing of commodities. His talk today will cover some aspects of trade finance fraud. I'll now hand over to Miranda for her talk on contractual flexibility in LNG. Thank you, Katia. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Katia said, my talk is on contractual flexibility in LNG. In particular, I'm going to focus on destination flexibility, and I'm going to talk through some of the points which lawyers and commercial teams may want to consider when structuring and drafting a cargo diversion clause. Before I get to that, however, I'm going to, to give some context to this topic of flexibility. I'm going to talk about the double black swan, which delivered a historic shock to natural gas markets last year and brought this topic of destination flexibility back into the spotlight in the, industry, in the LNG industry. Black Swan is a term coined by derivatives trader and risk analyst Nasi Nicholas Taleb. It means an event which is highly improbable and has a massive impact. The natural gas markets have experienced a flock of black swans in the last few years. To name a few, in 2006, the Russia-Ukraine gas disputes reached a peak and Russia cut off all gas that was transiting through Ukraine. In 2008, the financial crisis created an LNG supply glut. In 2011, the Fukushima earthquake um, shut down all 54 of Japan's nuclear power plants, creating um, an emergency demand for LNG. Subsequent to this event, Japan has become an advocate for increased flexibility in LNG commercial contracts, which is what my talk is about. In 2015, Yemen LNG declared force majeure and shut down their extraction plant, which has remained offline ever since due to the war. And in 2016, the government of the Netherlands confirmed it would wind down all production of natural gas from the giant gas field at Groningen due to safety concerns. The double black swan to which I referred at the beginning is COVID-19 and the oil price crash of April last year. These black swans arrived hot on the heels of the warm winter 2019-2020. That warm winter meant that at the beginning of last year, prices globally for natural gas were low due to oversupply. By April, there was unprecedented demand destruction caused by pandemic lockdowns and compounded by uncertainty created by the oil price. To illustrate the severity of this erosion of demand, S&P Global Platts reported that 167 cargoes of LNG that were due to load out of the United States between April and November 2020 were cancelled. That's a vast amount of gas, bearing in mind a single LNG cargo of conventional size, so 170,000 cubes, can heat a large town like Bath in England for six months. 
So what does this have to do with flexibility in LNG contracts and why is flexibility something that is talked about in LNG? It's due to the fact that LNG commercial contracts tend to be rigid in ways we don't see with other energy commodities and they have a number of characteristics that make them rigid. The first characteristic is they're typically long duration. So traditionally, as LNG started being commercialised back in the 1960s, LNG sale and purchase agreements or SPAs would be entered into between a seller who would be a producer and would have a, a need for guaranteed sales um, from their commercial contracts to cover their project financing costs. And on the other end of the transaction, the buyer would typically be an end user uh, often a utilities company or an industrial company, and those types of buyers require security of supply for a long time. So that's the first aspect of LNG SPAs that has made them rigid traditionally. The second aspect is take or pay. This dominates the LNG industry in relation to volume obligations. It means that the buyer bears the volume risk um, there are different ways of structuring a take or pay clause, but essentially the buyer has to pay for all or most of the natural gas that it has committed to take in each year of the SPA. And obviously over a term like 20 years or more, which it, and that's typically the length of um, that SPAs have been, um, it can be difficult to predict what will happen with demand. The third aspect which makes LNG SPAs rigid is destination restrictions. As the name suggests, these are provisions which prohibit the parties from taking the LNG to any destination other than the one named in the SPA. And these are popular clauses. They have been popular. Destination restrictions, however, may breach competition laws and the European Commission and the Japan Fair Trade Commission have indeed said that they will breach uh, the, the competition laws of, in their jurisdictions. Notwithstanding this big uh, competition law issue, destination restrictions have remained popular. The guidance issued by the European Union and the Japanese regulator doesn't bind every transaction and it doesn't apply outside of those jurisdictions. So destination restrictions have remained a mainstay. So it's against this background of rigidity in the commercial contracts that there is a conversation about flexibility. And over the last few years, there has been a trend towards more flexibility, and this has ramped up in the last year. There are a number of drivers here. The first I've mentioned already, black swans. So sellers and buyers need flexibility if they are to be able to react to unpredictable market disruptions. The second driver is seasonal fluctuation. So this is a predictable uh, disruption that happens every year, um, but some winters may be milder than others, some may be harsher. Uh, for example, the beast from the east winter a few years ago was a big disruption for the gas markets. The third driver is the financial maturation of liquefaction projects. So a lot of those um, extraction and liquefaction trains have now been completed and the project finance has been paid off. So producers and their marketing companies no longer have such a need to enter into such long term commercial contracts. Fourthly, the arrival of traders in LNG. So tra traders are relative newcomers in LNG, although they've been around now for some 20 years, and they brought, brought with them the possibility of short term trade, more agile business under master sale and purchase agreements, and also optionality for matching buyers to cargoes. So they've created competition within LNG on the supply side. And fifth, energy transition. So this is creating opportunities for LNG, but it's also creating competition for LNG as a commodity. As the cost base for renewables gets better and better, LNG will be forced to, to adapt and keep being more competitive. And part of this is probably going to be around being more flexible in the SPAs. Hitoshi Nishizawa of JERA, the biggest buyer of LNG in the world, said, long term SPAs with rigid terms are no longer suitable for a rapidly changing market. So what does destination flexibility mean? It is the right to take an LNG cargo to a destination other than the one named in the SPA. It means that the buyer's take or pay, take or pay liability, that burden on the buyer can be relieved. So if demand drops away in the buyer's uh, domestic market, which is normally the, the destination named in an SPA, the buyer can take the cargo to a different market where there is demand. Um, and meanwhile, it also creates the opportunity to engage in arbitrage 
how does destination flexibility work in practice? So the simplest thing to do would be to remove destination restrictions from SPAs. But as I mentioned earlier, they have remained a mainstay, notwithstanding the competition law issues. And sellers may not always want to get rid of destination restrictions. So what parties can do instead is include a cargo diversion clause in their SPA and linked to this, there will often be a profit share arrangement. So the seller and the buyer under the SPA will agree to divert the cargo to a customer in a new destination and the buyer and seller of the SPA will then share the diversion profits. So that's the profit generated from the diversion. The contract with the customer in the new destination can be entered into either by the buyer under the SPA if it takes title to and pays for the LNG cargo and it can then resell it to the customer. Alternatively, the SPA seller can sell directly to the customer. So I'm now going to walk through some points which lawyers and um, trading desk or commercial teams can may want to consider if they're going to do a cargo diversion clause in their SPA. The first point is competition law. I mentioned before that destination restrictions may be anti-competitive. Cargo diversions can also be anti-competitive sometimes. The European Commission has said that if the cargo diversion is agreed after title in the LNG has passed to the buyer, then the cargo diversion will be anti-competitive. In addition to this, the Japan regulator has said that if a seller were to unreasonably refuse a cargo diversion request, then the refusal would be anti-competitive. And in addition to those points, there are some more points uh, from a competition law perspective that can make this tricky. So um, it's always a good idea to involve a competition law specialist if you're going to divert a cargo. The second consideration is how to define the diversion right in the clause. By whom should the right be exercisable? So it will probably be the buyer, but possibly also the seller may want the opportunity to look for uh, arbitrage possibilities. Should the right to divert be limited in any way? It could be limited to a maximum number of cargoes. It could be limited to specific destinations only. You could also limit it to situations where the market price in the buyer's destinations, the contractual destination has fallen below the contract price, thus making the SPA unreasonable financially for the buyer. And should the seller have the right to refuse a diversion request? These points are all around the seller retaining a degree of control over diversions and all of them again could stray into the territory of competition law issues. So again, these are points to talk to a competition law specialist about. Uh, anything where a seller is trying to control or restrict um, what the buyer does with a cargo um, would be a red flag from a competition law point of view. Uh, thirdly, the impact on buyer's obligation to take. So what does the diversion mean for the, the buyer's annual obligation? Uh, is the diversion without prejudice to the buyer's obligation to take or will it form part of its annual quantity? Number four, it's a good idea to work in some language about timing and notice. The parties will need time to evaluate the diversion opportunity, to prepare documentation and then to execute the diversion. So some weeks or months notice should be built in before the cargo is due to be loaded. Any profit share arrangement that will be part of your cargo diversion needs to be drafted into the SBA clearly. Um, you may want to set out explicitly how the diversion profit is to be calculated. You may also want to consider any additional costs that may be incurred as a result of the diversion, for example, shipping costs, also savings. There may be shipping savings. Um, how will those be dealt with and accounted for? And how should the diversion profit be split between the buyer and seller under the SPA? The commercial team will want to consider a split that reflects the party's respective cost and risk of doing the diversion. Number six, which party will bear the risk of customer default? So what will happen if the customer in the new diversion, in the new destination defaults, he can't pay or can't perform in any way? What happens to the SBA party's respective profit sharing obligation? What credit security do they have in place? Seven, shipping. Is the vessel compatible with the terminal in the new destination? Do insurers, vessel insurers, cargo insurers, do they need to be told about the diversion? What local laws apply in the new destination? 
environmental laws and tax laws, for, for example, do we have any um, desire or need to pass title in the LNG before the vessel enters territorial waters? Would that be legal? And lastly, we, we would have to think about the vessel schedule. Can the vessel go to this alternative destination and then get back into its rotation in time to meet its next loading commitment? The next consideration is the price in the SPA. Should it be revised in light of the diversion? So if there is a profit share arrangement as part of this, then in theory, there should be no need to revise the price in the SPA because both parties to the SPA will be obtaining value from the diversion by virtue of the profit share. But sometimes there won't be a profit share and sometimes there will be, but it won't be as simple as what I just said. So the price could come into issue. In the famous case of Atlantic LNG of Trinidad and Tobago and Gas Natural, uh, Atlantic Energy were sellers under this 20-year SPA and they argued successfully in an ICC tribunal arbitration that the price should be revised in light of the fact that this, the buyer, Gas Natural, were exercising their contractual right to divert cargoes away from the contractual destination of Spain and over to New England and the United States instead. Atlantic Energy argued that the, as the price in the SBA had been modelled on the Spanish gas market and had been agreed on the understanding that that is where gas natural would take the gas, it should now be revised to reflect the market in New England. And Atlantic Energy, the sellers, won in principle on that in that case. How will disputes be handled? Are we happy for them to be handled as per the general dispute resolution clause in the SPA or do we want something bespoke? Disputes over the profit share calculation in particular could be technical and well suited to determination by an expert. And then you might want all other disputes to be referred to arbitration and court. If you or your client is diverting a cargo compliance, your or your, your client's compliance department should be involved. The customer and the new destination uh, needs to be screened for all the usual KYC risks like money laundering, um, tax evasion, fraud, anti-bribery, uh, corruption and so on. Um, and in particular, if there's a profit share, that means that you as an SBA party will be receiving proceeds from the sale to that, that customer. So you want to know where the money's came from. Export controls, if it's a US exported LNG cargo, we need to check that the new destination is a permitted destination for Department of Energy purposes. Sanction screening against the new customer and the new destination should also take place. I've come to the end of my time, so I'll just wrap up there. My final point was around exchange of information, um, but I have come to my time, so I will wrap up now. Thank you for listening to me. Um, let me just move on. OK, I am excited now to hand over to the next speaker, who is John, for his talk entitled Whose Terms Apply? Thank you very much, Miranda. Hello, everyone. Just seeking to take control of these slides. <coughs> While I do, I will set out my introduction. So whose terms apply? This is a question that we often have to answer in relation to oil trades for which the buyer and seller have tried to contract on their own terms. Now, sometimes this problem only emerges when we when arises when we look to look at a contract in order to answer another question. It, there we go, I have control. Now, it is common for several different versions of terms for the same trade to be exchanged by counterparties. Even after the contract has started to be performed, the parties will often counter and maintain their positions back and forth. To establish which terms apply, it is then necessary to look at the entirety of the correspondence and when the what and when the parties took steps to perform the contract. Why is this important? Sometimes it can make a big difference. For instance, I've seen a seller under a DAP sale contract manage to slip in its own terms in order to make the delivery period without guarantee after it beca became clear that its vessel was not going to arrive at the discharge port on time. Another example could be where one set of terms provides for arbitration and another for court jurisdiction. 
If a dispute arises later, you'll want to know which forum you need to go to to commence proceedings against your counterparty. Indeed, uncertainty over whether the English or German courts had jurisdiction was the very problem that arose in a case from this year that I'll describe later. So the question as to whose terms apply therefore can be important. I'll take you through the applicable legal principles and give you examples of their application. The intention will be to help you understand how to ensure you are clear on what terms apply to your contract and prevent your, con your contract unwittingly become subject to another party's terms. This slide are the legal concepts that I'll run through. I'll try to minimize the use of the legal lingo, but it is necessary to have a grounding in these concepts for, these subject, for this subject. First, I'll summarize the principles of offer and acceptance as they form the basis for this issue. Next, I'll show you how this applies to the back and forth of exchanges of terms that is known as the battle of the forms. The drama of this is captured by the picture on this slide. And as part of this, I'll also deal with what is known as the last shot doctrine. This essentially provides that the last set of terms exchanged before performance will apply. I'll give relatively straightforward examples from the English courts to illustrate these principles. And in particular, I'll run through a decision from this year that shows how to win the battle of the forms with the first shot. Finally, in all of this, I should say that each case will turn on its own specific facts. And in practice, applying the principles and working out whose terms apply will nearly always be more complicated than in the examples I give. Now, first of all, offer and acceptance. This is one of the key ingredients required for a contract to be formed under English law. To use the precise definition given at the first bullet point there, a contract requires that there be a final and un unqualified expression of assent to the terms of an offer. An offer can then be accepted expressly, but it can also be accepted by conduct. For instance, if a buyer makes an offer to a seller to buy goods, the seller can accept the offer by supplying the goods. Mere acknowledgement of an offer is not acceptance, and where an offer gives options, the acceptance must make it clear which option is agreed. A communication is not agreed if a communication is not acceptance if it attempts to vary the terms of the offer. Essentially, a counteroffer kills the original offer. The introduction of an entirely new term can be considered to be a counteroffer, and that is accepted if the new term would have been implied anyway. Finally, continuing negotiations do not mean that a contract has not already been concluded. It may be hard to establish when exactly there has been offer and acceptance. If one party sends another party a version of its terms after the contract has been formed, the new terms will, will, will apply unless they are accepted, will, won't apply unless they are accepted as variations. Again, this can include acceptance by conduct. If you receive new terms, you therefore have to be careful how you deal with them in case you can be taken to have unintentionally accepted them. So it is from the application of these principles set out here that the so-called battle of the forms arises and by applying them that we can establish whose terms apply. The last shot doctrine. Now, according to this, where conflicting communications have been exchanged, each of those communications is a counter offer. So that if a contract results, it must be on the terms of the final document before conclusion. For instance, if a contract is accepted by conduct in the form of, a, of delivery of a cargo, it would then be on the terms of the final document exchanged prior to delivery. The English court case Tecdata and Amphenol provides a good example of this. Now, Tecdata and Amphenol were part of a chain of suppliers to Rolls-Royce. Amphenol manufactured connectors, which Tecdata used to produce the cable harnesses that end up in all of your Rolls-Royces. Tecdata, as the buyer of the connectors, sent a purchase order to Amphenol, the seller, which contained Tecdata's general terms and conditions. Amphenol responded to Tecdata with an acknowledgement that incorporated its own general terms and conditions. Amphenol then delivered the connectors to Tecdata. Now, Tecdata thought that the contract was formed when Amphenol received Tecdata's purchase order. They were wrong. Amphenol did not communicate acceptance of Tecdata's terms. Instead, Amphenol counteroffered with its own terms, and as we know, a counteroffer kills an offer. Tecdata then accepted that offer by taking delivery of the connectors. And as, we, and as we also know, acceptance can be communicated by conduct. As Amphenol fired the, fine, the last shot before performance, its terms applied. In, in this case, in correspondence after the dispute had arisen, Amphenol had made no reference to their own terms. And in the course of performing the contract, Amphenol had also signed a certificate of conformance for the connectors as required by Tecdata's terms. This did not however make any difference to the offer and acceptance analysis. When establishing whose terms apply, you have to look objectively at what the parties did at the time the contract was concluded and not at their behaviour after the contract was performed. 
that covers the principles and how they apply. Now I'll give you examples of when timing, when, when things don't work out in such a straightforward way. The case of Butler and Excello shows the importance of using clear wording in the course of negotiations. In this case, Butler, the seller, gave a quotation for the sale of a machine to Excello. The quotation set out Butler's terms and conditions. Excello then placed the, an order on which there was a tear off slip for Butler to return. The slip stated that the order was accepted on Excello's terms. Butler signed and returned the slip, but stated that the machine would be delivered in accordance with their previous quotation. So it may appear from this that Butler fired the last shot and its terms should therefore apply. <clears throat> However, Butler's reference to its original quotation was insufficient to make its terms apply. On an objective interpretation of the exchanges as a whole, Butler's acknowledgement was an acceptance of Excello's terms. In their acknowledgement, they were only referring to delivery and were not countering with their own terms. This, and this was significant. Excello had taken delivery of the machine from Butler late and Butler was seeking a higher price on the basis of a price escalation clause included in their terms. Therefore, as Butler had accepted Excello's terms and its own did not apply, its claim failed. The lesson to take from this is that the party trying to fire the last shot must ensure that the other party's acceptance is subject to all of the terms offered in order to ensure that they apply. It also shows that the entirety of the parties and communications must be communi considered and interpreted in order to establish the position. The case of Sterling Hydraulics and Dictomatic makes a similar point to the previous one, so I'll run through it quite quickly. The buyer, Sterling Hydraulics, manufactured hydraulic valves and sent the seller, Dictomatic, a purchase order for O-ring seals that was subject to Sterling's terms and conditions. Dictomatic responded with an acknowledgement that stated that, that stated that delivery was based on their general terms of sale. Dictomatic did not, however, provide a copy of those terms. Dictomatic then delivered the seals to Sterling. Now it's found in this case that Dictomatic's acknowledgement was just that, it wasn't a counteroffer. References to general terms of sale can be sufficient to incorporate standard terms found elsewhere, for instance, where they're online or they're in common use in the industry. However, the words used in Dictomatic's acknowledgement were insufficient for that purpose. Again, this shows that it must be clear where a communication is intended to be a counteroffer and not a mere acceptance of the other party's terms. Finally, how to avoid losing the battle. Now, this is the court judgment from this year that provides an example of how to avoid losing the battle of the forms. Here's the picture of a party fine, firing their final shot in a negotiation. In 2011, TRW, as buyer, agreed to Panasonic's standard terms for future sales. Those terms didn't create an obligation to buy or sell any particular products at that point, and it was only agreed to be binding on future sales. Panasonic's terms included a provision that stated, even if no reference is made to them in particular cases, the following terms and conditions shall apply exclusively to the entire business relation with us, i.e. Panasonic. Sorry, I've gone flick through a slide. See that? Um, and um, particularly to all agreements for deliveries and services, unless different conditions, particularly conditions of purchase of the contracting party, have expressly been confirmed by us in writing. Conditions of the buyer, i.e. TRW, diverging from our terms and conditions, shall not be valid even if we have affected delivery or rendered services without reservation. Essentially, this prevented the application of TRW's, or what it sought to do was prevent the application of TRW's terms to future sales unless Panasonic agreed in writing, and that was even if TRW tried to fire the last shot. Subsequently, four or five years later, 2015 and 2016, TRW submitted purchase orders to Panasonic for resistors to be delivered in accordance with TRW's terms. Panasonic wasn't asked to sign and return the purchase order or confirm their agreement to TRW's terms, but they did act on TRW's purchase orders by delivering the resistors. On that basis, TRW claimed that they had fired the last shot and their terms applied, similar to the cases we looked at earlier. This was significant because TRW's terms provided for English law and jurisdiction, whereas Panasonic's terms provided for German law and jurisdiction, the problem that I identified at the outset. In the end, the court held that the Panasonic terms that TRW had agreed to many years earlier before its purchase applied. On that basis, it did not have jurisdiction to the court, the English court didn't have jurisdiction to hear TRW's claim. <clears throat> 
if TRW didn't want to be bound by the 2011 terms, their only options were either not to buy from Panasonic or to get Panasonic to agree in writing to give up the 2011 terms. Now this case shows that with careful drafting, it is possible to lock another party into your terms and avoid losing the battle of the forms. It may be difficult to introduce standard terms like Panasonic's permanently into a relationship between two trading parties. However, if a party includes a similar provision to that contained in Panasonic's terms as its first shot for a particular trade, it may be able to prevent the other party's terms from applying, even if that other party later manages to fire the last shot. So hopefully that provides a basis for ensuring that you're clear on whose terms apply and how to avoid accidentally becoming subject to another party's terms. I'll be happy to take questions later. In the meantime, I'll pass you on to Paul to discuss the contractual Im impact of dramatic price fluctuations. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening around the world. Um, yes, I'd like to talk to you about uh, something which uh, really hit uh, the news about a year or so ago and uh, we've certainly seen uh, major price fluctuations in the past and this will be something that uh, will remain uh, highly relevant i think so in late uh, march 2020 with global trade diminishing as a result of the pandemic and oil storage facilities around the world uh, whether on land or afloat reaching full capacity the downward impact on oil prices was dramatic for some products priced at a discount to specific indices, uh, we were approaching negative territory. It was in this context that our team was asked this simple question. What happens to an English law contract when the price payable becomes a negative value? We have seen negative price territory in the past. Uh, Miranda has referred you to a number of black swans in recent decades. West Texas natural gas prices went below zero in 2019. Canadian oil sands bitumen prices plummeted in 2018. North Dakota sour was selling at minus 50 cents a barrel in 2016. And of course, there was the oil price crash of 2014. We're not going to be immune from major price fluctuations in the future and there are grades of dirtier product which will continue to trade at a discount. So I hope this brief presentation uh, will be of use to you and remains topical. English law has considered uh, dramatic price movements, but in the context of force majeure clauses, and I'll come to that later. As to enforceability of a contract with a negative price, this hasn't yet been considered by the English courts. So this talk represents our views based on fundamental English law principles. To answer the question of what legal effects dramatic price movements may have on a sale contract, we need to consider that contract both at the point of formation and at the point of performance. For contracts to be validly concluded in English law, John uh, mentioned the requirements of offer, acceptance, consideration, and intention to enter into legal relations. Of these principles, the one which would be of concern when focusing on price is consideration. Consideration is defined, as you'll see from my slide, as conferring benefit or suffering a detriment. Um, but English law recognises that consideration need not pass from a buyer to a seller, but it may validly pass instead from a buyer to a third party. So if a buyer charters a vessel and pays freight or hire to the ship owner to lift a cargo, that detriment for the buyer passing to the third party ship owner would satisfy the test of consideration for the purchase contract the buyer has with the seller. So, so this is irrespective of whether any ultimate price is paid for the cargo once it's been quantified either at the date of contract or around the date of delivery, depending on the pricing clause. So if 
the price became negative at the time payment becomes due, that won't ordinarily invalidate the formation of the sale contract itself. So if the contract is validly formed, will significant movements in price affect performance? During performance of the contract, an event must not intervene which radically alters performance such that the obligations under the contract become wholly different from those contemplated by the parties at the time it was concluded. If there is such an event radically altering performance, it is said to frustrate the contract, discharging the parties from further performance. However, if that event simply causes performance to be more onerous, more costly, the contract remains in force. Now, when referring to frustration and force majeure, of course, in, in English law context, frustration is not dissimilar from the civil law freestanding concept of force majeure. But for an English lawyer, force majeure is a term that's given to a contractual frustration clause where the clause will specify certain events which exonerate performance, suspend performance and ultimately can produce termination. Um, so we'll be looking at both of these principles, but obviously FM is for us a contractual frustration clause. Generally, these types of pricing concerns come into play for longer term supply contracts. Spot contracts are concluded more closely normally to the point of delivery, so uh, pricing concerns should be reduced and hedged against in any event. Where we're looking at a pre-existing long-term supply contract, will an event which causes prices to crash to a point where seller pays buyer to take delivery amount to a frustrating event? Well, our view is that in most cases, the contract simply become more onerous to perform rather than radically different, and it will remain enforceable. There will be reasons why the seller still wishes to sell, whether price is loss making or even negative, for instance, to free up capacity, to avoid storage costs or decommissioning costs. Where the parties enter into a spot contract, readily in the knowledge of deflated prices, performance will not be radically different from that contemplated by the parties. So no frustration. The seller will be taken to want to offload product for whatever its own commercial reasons, uh, where the seller had to pay the buyer to take the product. So let's turn to force majeure. FM has, of course, been considered a great deal since the outbreak of the pandemic. If I were to give you one dollar, one euro or one pound for every article that's been written about FM over the last 12 months, I'm confident you could all retire. FM clauses in the contract or incorporated by way of GTCs, of course, need to be examined to see whether a dramatic fall in prices linked to an epidemic or otherwise could come within the contractually identified classes of event which suspend or ultimately exonerate further performance. But in most cases, it is very unlikely that an FM clause would cover what is in effect economic hardship. Moreover, if an FM clause requires the absence of foreseeability, it will not cover price fluctuation. It will be eminently foreseeable to anyone participating in the energy business how much prices can move in a short space of time. The English courts have decided on several occasions that changes in market prices, if not expressly identified in FM clauses, did not amount to force majeure events and were not frustrating events. I've put two on the slides here for you. Mr Justice Clark, in the case of Thames Valley and Total Gas, said that the fact that a contract has become expensive to perform, even dramatically more expensive, is not a ground for force majeure or frustration. 
and Mr Justice Hamlin in the more recent case of Tandron Aviation and Aerotoy says it is well established under English law that a change in economic market circumstances affecting the profitability of a contract or the ease of performance is not regarded as being a force majeure event. In that case, a party was seeking to rely upon unanticipated, unforeseeable and cataclysmic downward spiral of the markets, the world's markets after the 2008 crash a an FM event to seek to excuse non-payment for the balance due for an aircraft. That failed. So the principle itself of a seller paying to deliver product to a buyer is not beyond the realms of commerce. Bloomberg reported that Mercuria bid in March 2020 for Wyoming asphalt sour which is used in the production of paving bitumen at a price of minus 19 cents a barrel. So any seller accepting that bid have agreed to pay Mercuria to take delivery. Factors such as hedging, ability to store in a heavily contangled market and the position of the parties, producer to off taker versus trader to trader, have to be taken into account when considering contracts at a negative price. So by way of recap, English law contracts affected by major price fluctuations will be found to have been validly formed and however significant a price shock, it will simply have rendered performance of the contract more onerous for the seller. And so it's not a frustrating event at the time performance becomes due. Furthermore, it's very unlikely to be an FM event without very specific wording. So what can you do to protect against dramatic price fluctuations in your sale contracts? Well, for longer term contracts, you might want to consider building in an economic hardship clause. Distinct from an FM clause, an economic hardship clause will more aptly cater for large price movements. In the case of Superior Overseas Development and British Gas, Superior, along with Philips Petroleum, signed 25-year agreements to sell North Sea natural gas to British Gas. The agreements contained a price review trigger, a clause, triggered by substantial economic hardship. The Court of Appeal decided in that case that the phrase meant more than everyday variations uh, to uh, and difficulties arising uh, in economic circumstances, but where substantial hardship was acknowledged, price adjustments should be made to compensate for the entire period of that hardship. So a hardship clause normally states that if there are changes in the market which affect the price, uh, the contract price, to a particular degree resulting in hardship to either party parties will meet to renegotiate and if they cannot within a fixed period there may be an option either to terminate or for an independent expert to make binding price adjustments. To ensure the efficacy of such a clause the degree of price change might be best expressed by setting upper and lower price points or percentage variations or for hardship itself to be clearly defined by reference to a specified minimum profit margin or economic return. The more objective the criteria used to define hardship, the greater the likelihood that the clause will be enforceable. Now, of course, uh, hedging is necessarily a mechanism that is used, has to be used, and is recognised as English law as one expects uh, trading parties to use, um, whether individually or by way of umbrella hedge to cover these eventualities. But you could also introduce a price floor in your uh, pricing clause. Uh, this protects against negative pricing, particularly if the price is fixed subject to a discount. You could set a, a floor of zero or one dollar per tonne per queue, whatever you wish, 
um, below which the price will not go. Uh, the court or arbitrators considering any dispute uh, where the price has gone into negative territory might imply a term that you can't pay a price less than zero, but it's always safer to expressly provide for that in the contract. So, for example, for ISDA contracts, uh, model wordings with price flaws were introduced uh, in October 2020. So, um, if you have any questions, um, we'll happily deal with them a little bit later. But thanks very much for listening, and I'm going to pass you over now uh, to um, Mark Aspinall, who's going to speak to you about uh, fraud in trade finance. Thank you, Paul. I'm just wondering if. OK, thank you, Paul. Um, <clears throat> well, inevitably covering a subject as wide as this uh, in 15 minutes is a challenge in itself. Um, however, I hope at the end of this presentation um, you'll feel better informed on some of the red flags uh, to watch out for and perhaps better prepared uh, in taking additional steps to at least minimise that risk. What we're going to do in this presentation, we're going to look at events in 2020 and their effect on the market. Uh, we'll have a brief summary of typical trade finance structures and where they are prone to fraud, and then followed by looking at ways to prevent at least uh, to, to a degree certain practices occurring uh, and remedies uh, if unfortunately you're the victim uh, of a fraud and then concluding with what the future uh, 2021 and beyond holds. So, so fraud can take many forms, but in this context, really what one is looking at is an, an intended outcome of deception. So either through the creation of artificial trade uh, to gain funds or by the use of genuine trade uh, for the same purpose. Um, and it, it could be said that COVID-19 and the collapse of the Brent crude uh, uh, price led indirectly to the exposure of, of questionable practices uh, predominantly in the in the oil trading sector. But we should also, um, I think, put things in context in that Approximately uh, the global merchandise trade is around US $18 trillion, of which say half of which is supported by some sort of trade finance. So from a monetary perspective, although uh, although the, the, the trade finance frauds that, that one comes across uh, are a small proportion of that, the economic sentiment um, and its effect on the market can be can be far reaching. And you know, as often is said, bad news travels fast and good news takes the scenic route. And that's certainly the case um, when events unfold, unf unfolded in Singapore uh, around March of 2020, uh, with a big commodity house accused of massive premeditated and systemic deception, uh, was exposed, uh, has exposed banks to the tune of $1.5 billion. And then one of Asia's one of Asia's largest uh, independent trading houses collapsed on the accusations of fraud. And again, you see the figures there; they're not uh, insignificant, 3.5 billion. And then there's a sort of domino effect, which is nothing to do with the, the pizza company. Um, but then three oil traders similarly collapsed, accused of multiple financing. And as COVID spread uh, from east to west. So it seemed that the, uh, the, the, the trade finance frauds took a similar route and a big uh, Middle East uh, oil trader and bunker supplier who had its own terminals and shipping fleet uh, became uh, the subject of a whole host of uh, accusations of different types of fraud, which left banks exposed uh, to the tune of, of uh, over 1.5 billion. 
And when we look at the effect this has, it's not so much an effect on uh, the banks and the traders who are, in, who are, the, are the victims of the fraud. What, what, I, what I want to touch upon is that as a result of this, it makes banks very nervous in terms of continuing in the commodity trade uh, financing business. And in fact, one bank, because of the uh, Singapore oil trader collapsed, um, completely withdrew from uh, that uh, area of the business. A couple of other well-known uh, financing banks also uh, either consolidated or refused to take on, on new customers. And the effect of that, of course, is, is that it affects the, 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 the SMEs, the small to medium entities' uh, ability to obtain finance, even if they have no link to some of the companies who uh, who were the subject of allegations of fraud. And there's this term, this flight to quality, where the, the banks only seem to, as a whether as a knee-jerk reaction or whether as a policy decision, uh, focus solely on the on the on the on the quality, uh, high-value uh, traders. Uh, typically, uh, examples such as the big three independents. And of course, what this does by uh, by chance rather than by design, it encourages the shadow banking sector to fill that trade finance gap. And what happens is the large commodity traders effectively then become financial financial institutions. And all one is doing is regurgitating or recirculating funds from the top of the pyramid uh, down below, which is you know, not great for uh, liquidity and flexibility in terms of the uh, in terms of the SMEs. So looking at the some familiar uh, trade financing structures, if you like, um, we, we look at inventory financing, which is basically asset based lending. And based on the value of the inventory or as our American cousins would call it the stock. And, and usually the financier will have a pledge uh, over uh, those goods, which are held uh, usually in warehouses as it concerns metals and uh, tankage in the case of oil. And it's important for the lender or the financier to have control uh, and or access either physically or to information concerning the movement in and out of, of that asset of those goods in the uh, in, in the in the warehouse or, or storage facility. And one also has to be careful when looking at documents that purport to give title to those goods. In some jurisdictions, uh, warrants are documents of title. Those, for, those familiar with the LME uh, business will recognise that. But in other countries, they're not. And certainly warehouse receipts and holding certificates are not uh, documents of title. And so the, uh, the financier has to be careful as to what he thinks he has, when in fact, perhaps he doesn't. And lastly, it's important to know the relationship between the borrower and the warehouse keeper, where the, where the borrower in fact owns the warehouse or in fact it's subleased to a company that's, a, that's affiliated or associated with him. So again, uh, uh, cautionary uh, uh, tales have, have arisen uh, due to lack of, of, of understanding of that relationship. And then turning to receivables finance, here, the lender is purchasing or financing a debt, if you like, in relation to goods which are represented by the value of an invoice. And from the financier's point of view, um, it's important that the goods existed at the time of invoicing, that the debt has been incurred pursuant to a genuine contract, and that the seller of those goods has the capacity to assign and sell that debt to the financier, and that finally that the debt in the hands of the financier is enforceable in terms of no set off provisions or no existing disputes which would otherwise dilute the value of the debt that he has purchased. And then finally, uh, what's uh, what I've termed the traditional documentary letter of credit financing. And here I just want to focus on on three documents. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the actual mechanics of the letter of credit uh, uh, facility. And that's the, the, the bill of lading, the invoice and the letter of indemnity, uh, often referred to as the LOI. Uh, 
and that's uh, specifically in relation to, as you can guess from the reference to bill of lading, to goods that are shipped. So those are uh, examples of uh, some of the uh, more common trade finance uh, uh, structures that we encounter. And then we look at now the schemes, and I call them schemes because most of these are are foreseeable, if you like. But but the problem is is that they are unexpected, and because of the existing relationship of the customer with the banks or the financiers, that's the problem uh, that that one doesn't expect this to happen. So just taking a few of these. Uh, so far as inventory financing is concerned, you have uh, goods that originally were there, but are no longer there, so they no longer exist. You have fake receipts overstating the quantity of goods, so the, the asset value is greater than it actually is. And a famous case is the Qingdao 2014, which you'll probably be familiar with, where uh, the uh, Chinese company uh, basically used the same goods as pledge collateral to various lenders in terms of uh, refined copper and aluminium ingots. And the problem that was faced there, that we, there was local collusion at the port, which makes it very difficult uh, to combat uh, such, uh, such schemes. Then on receivables finance, again, similarly, you have fictitious invoices uh, where goods never existed, and that's a common uh, a common usage by, by money launderers. Then you have duplicate in, invoices for, for genuine goods where one invoice has already been paid, but the uh, borrower uh, raises another invoices and, and receives discounted financing from its, uh, from its lender. And then you have over invoicing where, uh, where the, the seller of the goods uh, increases the value of the invoice and then issues credit notes to uh, the buyer, the debtor, but it does not disclose that to the financier. So when the debtor comes to uh, recover the debt it has paid for, it finds that it's worth sometimes even half the value or even a quarter of the value. And letters of credit. I'll just take a few of these given the, the time constraints. Uh, the circular transaction, this requires complicity uh, of partners outside of the original uh, trader, if you like. So the trader uh, gets financing to purchase a cargo. Then, uh, it, so it pay, the bank pays the supplier. That supplier then transfers those funds to a third party who's complicit in all of this, who then sells it back to the trader who, who originally sought the financing. Whilst this creates not great profit, what it does, it inflates the trader's turnover, so it's able to then approach its bank and have extended credit facilities on, on basically uh, a, a circular transaction, hence, hence its name. Then you have multiple transactions where the trader gets financing for a cargo, the bank holds the documents uh, as uh, security in relation to that financing, the cargo is then transferred to another vessel and the trader creates new documents and, and, and raises financing with another bank. So uh, that's a, 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 an interesting one as to as to competing banks claims to whether uh, they have rights to the goods. And the double whammy is, is not some sort of archaic uh, trade finance term, but it's basically a continuation of the uh, multiple transaction where the trader also sells the same cargo to a company with a fictitious invoice and then asks its bank to discount that invoice. So the bank loses that twice, if you like. And as I said, the common thread is through all these things is that it happens with large and integrated companies, previously reliable and rarely unforeseen, but as, as we say, uh, always unexpected. Different time. I'm now stuck on that one. Okay. So prevention. Well, most of these are uh, not uh, innovative in the sense of that they're expected. Or one would take these sorts of of steps prior to uh, offering financing, but you'd be surprised um, because uh, you know 
extended checking, extended, extended diligence, if you like, takes time and uh, banks and financiers are interested in making profit as well. So there's a balance to strike in a, a, between the two. So you can appraise that underlying business, you know, does it mirror the market? You can verify the information and re verify the relationship uh, uh, to the borrower and whether a true contract exists. You can optimize the financing structure. So, you know, if the lender is relying on the borrower to supply documents or perform a task to perfect security, for example, ask for an explanation and you can inspect the documents. It's amazing how little inspection takes place, bearing in mind that scanners and copiers is often said to facilitate the falsification of documents. So, uh, you know, these are just some steps that you can uh, engage and employ to at least minimise the risks. And what are the remedies? Unfortunately, unfortunately not that many. Um, the borrower will go into liquidation. Uh, the creditor will become uh, the, the the borrower, the uh, the lender rather, will become a creditor in insolvency. Sometimes fettered by restructuring and standstill agreements. And whilst uh, in some instances there can be uh, a preference over unsecured creditors uh, or, or other creditors under the pari passi rule, there's nothing in the pot. It doesn't really offer you very much. And where there is no assets uh, in the first place, basically it's hopeless. There is uh, an equitable uh, remedy, although it's more of a quasi remedy because it doesn't really give you uh, a result that identifies where monies have been uh, passed to through tracing actions. Although how far that is recognised in other jurisdictions is also a question as to how effective it is. And really the only real action one can take and, and hence the reference to Bill of Lading and LOI is that is that usually there is an action available against the ship owner for misdelivery in terms of delivering cargo against an LOI as opposed to the uh, bill of lading that the bank holds as uh, its its pledge if you like it's uh, over that collateral but again question how how to what extent that vessel has been mortgaged where that vessel is going the jurisdiction whether it's friendly to arrest and and the the, the only thing I can advise is that you have to move with speed. Sorry about this. Okay. So looking forward and in conclusion, because it's predicted there are going to be uh, a great deal, many more insolvencies due to the economic circumstances resulting from uh, the present climate, um, what does one what does one predict? Um, well, you've got I've, I've put in there operational oversight, and I think that is much more of a uh, much more of a effective way of, of combating this rather than trying to change the uh, uh, financing structures itself. I mean, they've, they've stood the test of time, um, and, and how commodities are financed. Are, pretty stable, but it's having more operational oversight. And given the scandals associated with Singapore, um, uh, in late November there was a code of best practices for the commodity financing launched by the Association of Banks there in Singapore, which lays out uh, practices uh, uh, and key principles in governing uh, prudent uh, uh, operational practices in the, in the financing. And finally, digitize, digi digitization. OK, so you know, there's been a move to blockchain where the uh, there's been a, a digital trade finance registry uh, set up uh, by uh, DBS and Standard Chartered and other banks in Singapore. And uh, again, uh, there are competing platforms for that um, because banks still do like to be competitive. And when one looks at the documentation, the eagles of lading, that sort of holy grail uh, is often referred to in terms of shipping documentation. The problem is that there's no sound legal framework over that, that mimics the existing rights and obligations under that, that very important document. And as someone said, you know, 300 years of legal precedent is hard to give up. So at the end of the day, uh, there are moves to, uh, if you like, um, make things more uh, regularized, um, more regulatory control, uh, 
uh, and market sort of participation in in achieving that purpose. But it's still a physical business, and you cannot divorce the two. That's that's the problem. Um, but anyway, hopefully, thank you for listening. Uh, it's given you some insight, and I think questions uh, will take place uh, at some point uh, after this. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mark, and thanks everyone for your very interesting presentations. Uh, we can take a couple of questions now. We have a little bit of time. Uh, the first one is for John. It relates to the last shot doctrine. Often in oil contracts, the broad terms are agreed and performance of the contract takes place before some of the finer points, often relating to late time and emerge terms are agreed. If there is a long history of ping pong over, say, the late time allowance, can it be said that the last counter prior to commencement of loading applies? If so, I believe this can be abused by some parties by sending a counter five minutes prior to commencement of loading, giving the other side no opportunity to respond. Thank you very much, Katia, and thank you to the person who raised this question. So um, I think there certainly is the potential for uh, abuse of the battle of the forms, um, and I alluded to that early in my uh, presentation and as to why you have to be careful that you don't unintentionally accept someone's terms. Um, in the particular example given, um, I'd say you have to return to the principles that I outlined earlier and um, while conduct may be um, sufficient to amount to uh, acceptance, of another party's terms, it's, that's not always going to be the case. And as was also demonstrated by the examples that I discussed earlier, what has to be done is, is an objective review of the party's exchanges and when they took place. And in this example, I would have thought that the outcome would be that you would say that objectively looking at an offer and an offer being made and then loading taking place five minutes later, you wouldn't have thought that that um, that action of loading uh, would that conduct would be sufficient to amount to an acceptance of an offer that was only made five minutes previously. Uh, time would be required to consider the offer and instructions would then be given um, for loading. So uh, looking at that objectively, I wouldn't have thought that specific example, um, you would say that that last shot would would have landed. Um, and on this point, finally, I should just also add that it's not just um, loading that could amount to um, um, acceptance by conduct. There are many different ways that this could be done, and that's why you've got to got to stay on your toes uh, when you receive um, an offer in the course of this um, battle of the forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Uh, and that is all we have time for today. Um, we have received some questions to which we can't respond right now, unfortunately. But if you have asked a question, uh, please do drop us a line after this and we can respond to you directly. Thank you everybody again for joining us today and I hope you have a nice reminder of your day and for those of you in the East, uh, I hope you have a good evening. The webinar is now ended. Thank you again.